can't multitask very well. Um, so Drew started his career as a high school mathematics teacher and a coach at Clearwater, Kansas, was a high school principal and superintendent at Burden, Kansas, and has served 13 years as a superintendent at Thayer Central in Hebron, Nebraska, before he came to the ESU 9. Drew and his wife, Amy, um, who is a League of Women Voters member, and she's with us today, um, have three children, the youngest of, of the of the three, um, two of them are now in college, and um, Drew and Amy and his family live just west of Hastings on an acreage by Junietta. So again, thank you, Drew, for being with us today. He is going to talk to us about how the schools have been affected by COVID-19. So if everybody would put their um, selves on mute, we'll turn things over to Drew. Thank you, Chris. I am going to share my screen here. So give me just a second to get the technical glitches worked out and we'll get started. All right. As indicated in the introduction, I've been in this business for 35 years in various roles and, and without a doubt, this has been the most challenging time I have witnessed in education. I was a superintendent in, in 1997 when the avian flu was the big scare and of course, uh, we had the Y2K scare in 99 that we spent uh, hours and hours preparing for. Um, been through federal changes, discrimination claims, bond issues, building projects, etc. But they all pale in comparison to the strain the pandemic has put on the educational system and the people involved. Uh, parents, students, staff, board members, it's just truly a challenging time. Yet I do believe that educators have stepped up to try to meet these challenges uh, to the best of their ability and working hard to keep everything together, even though it does kind of feel like we're using duct tape to do that at times uh, to hold it all together. As uh, Chris indicated, I'm Drew Harris. I'm in my second year here at Educational Service Unit 9 in Hastings. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you today, and I've enjoyed the opportunity to work with our area schools to try to keep them uh, moving through this challenging time. At ESU 9, uh, service truly is our middle name, and we have certainly tried to step up our efforts to serve uh, the needs of our districts at this point. Uh, and I would have to say, at the start of the 2021 school year, I don't know if kids have ever been more excited about going back to school than they were this last year. We all need motivation in life and, and uh, here's mine. Uh, as was mentioned, I have three kids. Uh, Hank and Maggie are, at, uh, are in the upper left. They're at uh, UNL and Wesleyan respectively. And our oldest Cole is in the upper right. He's going full time with the Kansas Air Guard now and working on trying to become a pilot. And my lovely wife, Amy, there beside me, uh, she should get some kind of award for putting up with me for 26 years now, I have to admit. And uh, I should add here, she is a Hastings College grad and as mentioned, a uh, member of the League of Women Voters. So I do hear about some of your meetings and it sounds like you've got some good things going on. If you're not familiar with ESU 9, uh, the best analogy I've heard for an ESU is that an ESU is to schools as a farmer's cooperative is to farmers. We try to provide services that schools may not be able to get on their own. Uh, for example, a lot of small and medium-sized schools wouldn't have the need for a full-time school psychologist or a vision specialist, but we can work with those schools to provide one that is shared between those districts or between other schools outside of the units region even. You can see our uh, service area there uh, goes up to Aurora, that's in the map. Uh, we include a part, uh, good part of Hamilton County. So Aurora, Hampton, over to Sutton on the east side, over to Kennesaw on the west, uh, down to Superior and Red Cloud on the south. We serve 14 schools in all. And uh, the topic today is to discuss, you know, how the pandemic has 
affected education and uh, that's a pretty broad topic. So I'm not gonna get real deep, but uh, we'll talk about a lot of different things. We will try to focus specifically on three areas and that's educational instruction, uh, emotional and physical well-being, and school leadership. So to start out, educational instruction. Last year was flying along about like normal. Uh, we, you know, we heard some rumors uh, about a new virus in China shortly after the new year, but really <coughs> significantly get on anybody's radar until maybe February. In uh, March, uh, specifically March 7th, the first Nebraska cases came up and the first Nebraska school closed down. Uh, Fremont Public Schools had exposures. Obviously, this was new to everybody. Uh, big schools especially were very concerned, just understandably, due to the numbers of students they have and the potential for spread and exposure. So the schools uh, started falling pretty quick, I have to admit. Uh, March 7th, the first school closed down. By the week of March 16th, schools were given a directive from the Department of Education that all schools should be closed by the end of that week. And the last school in ESU 9 to close was on March 19th, and that was uh, Red Cloud Public Schools. Uh, you know, this was kind of tough for smaller communities that maybe weren't experiencing any cases in their community or some counties, several of our counties didn't even have cases at that time, but uh, that was the directive we were given and, and certainly everybody was, was a little nervous about uh, what that future held and, and where things were going. No one knew how long that might last at that time. Some envisioned that, oh, maybe we'll be back in a, in a few weeks or a month, kind of let it play out like the normal flu. And uh, obviously that was not the case. I would add on March 16th, we held a superintendent's uh, meeting via Zoom and uh, discussed various issues with our schools. We have uh, 14 school districts, all 14 superintendents were on that call, and we have met weekly via Zoom ever since that date. I, there might have been a few weeks in the summer that we didn't meet, but that has been nearly weekly since March 16th that we've been meeting with all of our soups. And having discussion between the superintendents has really helped them, I think, you know, in, in figuring out how to, to work with this to hear stories from your neighbors and, and be able to communicate and, and sound things out. At that time, all districts in March, all districts were required to file a remote learning plan with the Department of Ed. And uh, schools were, were given very little guidance about what that might entail to allow for flexibility. And uh, obviously, they made it clear that everyone was expected to do something as far as providing some education. Approaches to this varied greatly. As you can imagine with little direction, uh, it was all across the board. Some schools took attendance, some didn't. Some graded materials, some just had kids handed in and it was never graded. Some indicated that a student's grade could not go down. Some indicated that their expectations were going to be just like normal, that, that uh, everything was gonna be graded and, and kids were going to be held accountable for everything. So it truly was across the board, across our state and even in our service region. Uh, some districts, often larger districts with high, or districts with high poverty rates opted to provide enrichment uh, through instruction packets, uh, materials that could be picked up at school or, or delivered to homes or mailed out. Uh, one of the large factors in that decision being the availability of internet access in, in homes. That's a tough one. If you've got high poverty rates, you might have a lot of families that don't have access. So at that point in March, obviously that was a major concern over the summer, it was stepped up to try to address that. At least we go back to that uh, 
remote learning format. Obviously, a lot of things are covered in the course of a school year, but uh, when you're remote, you can't do all that. So schools were trying to figure out, you know, what's truly essential for kids. If we're only going to be able to do a limited amount of stuff in that reduced time that we have, you know, we've got to cover the essential stuff. And, you know, that's tough. Uh, the arts took a hard hit last year on, on that. Uh, as you can imagine, you can't do music, uh, band, uh, physical education. A lot of the elective classes uh, did not get much attention. I, and, and that's unfortunate because for some kids, that's what really excites them about school. Others expected kids to be online as much as possible and almost tried to keep a regular school day going from, uh, you know, maybe 8.30 to 3.30 remotely. And, and that's pretty tough on kids too, as you can imagine uh, being in front of your computer screen and on Zoom meetings for six or seven hours is hard too. So no great answers, but you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of different expectations. Uh, out there. And this also varied by grade level, because certainly a kindergartner or first grader isn't going to have the attention span to do remote learning that a, that a high school student might have. So two big questions that loomed in educators' minds, you know, what's the availability of, of internet and technology? And a second big area of concern and was for those vulnerable students that have disabilities and a uh, couple of issues there. You know, th those are very vulnerable students and, and needed that help and assistance and also tends to be an area of great litigation in education. If you're not meeting regulations, uh, could you potentially uh, end up with difficulties in funding or, or legal issues? So educational instruction in the spring of 2020, uh, everybody's trying to figure out what do we need to do? Develop your remote learning plan and decide what's essential. Some took a week or two off to, to develop this. Others got into it the very next day, and did it on the fly. It, that was across the board as well. I think two weeks was about the maximum I've heard of any schools really taking time off to prepare. But a lot of things to get figured out in that process. Uh, excuse me, I slipped the slide there. Uh, teachers were trying to work to figure out what's essential. They were trying to figure out how do I take this material that I've worked with for years that I've given kids and now put that in an online format because most teachers did very little with online instruction prior to COVID-19. So certainly a challenge. You can imagine being a teacher for 20 years and, and having all your materials ready and kind of a set curriculum that you've gone through and all of a sudden, hey, do this online. Very challenging. So not only to transfer that to the online format, but then also to learn how to utilize the online format so you could deliver instruction that way. Because again, teachers weren't familiar with, with doing that. Think about how your own skills have changed with Zoom in the last six months. It's been dramatic. Uh, you know, I figured out how to do virtual backgrounds. I'm not really in the parking lot, I'm in my office. So, you know, just figuring out how to use these tools uh, was certainly challenging for a lot, but a major task for them to become proficient in this. Parents had uh, issues trying to juggle work schedules, worried about continuation of employment, uh, trying to figure out childcare, and then become their child's teacher uh, on top of all that. So certainly trying to juggle uh, work and being that surrogate teacher tough on parents. And students certainly challenged in this as well. To adapt to remote learning and, and to be in that isolated environment, uh, dealing with a lot of issues. Uh, we'll expand on that a little bit more in a bit, but I would add kids 
really started out strong, I think, when, when this all began in March. And uh, most kids tried to give their best. But I think by late April, that, that newness of the format had pretty well worn off. And, and you could see it was getting challenging to, to stay involved and connected. Somewhere during this time in the spring, we were also trying to figure out what are we going to do about summer school and extended school year experiences uh, that, that special education students might need. And then, of course, uh, as we got to May, the focus turned toward the really important stuff, uh, awards and recognition events, prom, and uh, of course, graduation, all of the senior rituals. And I think we certainly all recognize that the seniors of 2020 truly did get kind of a short straw on all this. Uh, they missed a lot of those experiences last spring that have become the accepted norm. Uh, I know parents struggled with, with that and, and watching their kids miss out on that too. Several schools tried to do, uh, you know, virtual events for these things. Uh, several postponed graduation and did them this last summer, and that's great. Uh, got kids recognition uh, one way or the other, whether that be virtual or, or later in the summer. But those were tough things on kids. So as we got into preparation for the 2021 school year, the main goal was we want to try to make this as normal as possible. There's obviously a, was a sentiment that kids need to be in school. They need it academically, socially, emotionally. We just need schools. And parents, you know, were excited to uh, uh, certainly get back into that as well. And our economy needed it. Uh, so great planning took place in consultation with our health departments and the Department of Ed. And I should mention also NERCSA, the uh, Nebraska Rural and Community School Association uh, got superintendents together and worked in committees to, I, I think over 200 school superintendents worked on various committees to try to prepare for that return to school and making that as normal as possible. Uh, certainly part of this was trying to prepare for that percentage of the enrollment that would not return. Whether you had students that were at high risk due to medical issues or, or perhaps their family just uh, had household members that you know, could not be exposed to the potential for this or kids whose parents were just too scared to send them uh, or ref and some families that refused to send kids because they wouldn't let their child abide by the masking regulations that the school might have. Um, so it was certainly a percentage of the kids we needed to prepare for there. A lot of districts that are uh, larger in size, I know Kearney, Grand Island, Hastings, for example, gave families the option of doing virtual learning as opposed to coming into the school buildings. Uh, with larger staffs, they were at a able to dedicate some teachers just to that virtual format. And it was quite interesting that across the state, nearly all the schools that did that ended up with roughly 12 to 15% of their population that opted for that online format. Thought that was quite interesting that that was the norm across the entire state. Hastings Public, for example, had 13% of their students that opted to go with the virtual format as opposed to being in person. And uh, then preparing for a mix. I know some schools uh, started out by going with a hybrid schedule of having some students in person and, and, and uh, some online and then switching that. The idea was to create cohort groups so that if one student was exposed, it wouldn't necessarily take out the entire class, but would only take out that student's cohort group. So it limited the exposure to a smaller number of students. So uh, that was another example of something schools got into. And then 
you know, we also prepared to go fully remote again if, if and when that need arose. So schools worked to make sure that their students had access to technology and, and internet uh, so that they'd be prepared for this. Uh, typically in the summer, things slow down in the school setting, as you can imagine. People take some time off, get on vacations. Uh, I did not see much of that this summer. Over the summer, we were still getting 10 to 14 of our superintendents on our weekly Zoom meetings. Uh, people really worked tirelessly through the summer trying to prepare for this return to school. Our second focus was emotional and physical well being. Uh, looking at my clock, I can see I need to pick up the pace a little bit. I've been at this 20 minutes already, and we're about halfway. So I'll, I'll go a little faster here. Emotional and physical well being of, of students, parents, staff uh, is the goal and the toll it took on folks. For students, you know, the biggest concern and first concern. And sadly, a large number of kids are affected by this, but their best meal of the day is sometimes the meal they get at school. And no child's going to be worried about learning if, if they don't feel like they're getting enough to eat. I would say that all 14 of our school districts continued to provide lunches to kids throughout the shutdown. Some even provided breakfast and uh, weekend meals. So you know, schools really stepped up to try to meet that, uh, that food issue. Some students live in environments where, uh, you know, unfortunately, maybe they have challenges at home and uh, created safety concerns. Typically, the highest uh, reporting of child abuse occurs from reports from school districts. So without that child being in school, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services was really worried about uh, the well being of some kids through that process. So, schools, several schools did uh, wellness visits with families. Schools today do so much more than just education. They have counselors, mental health therapists, nurses, coaches, teachers who care about these kids and are part of their lives. So, to take that away was certainly detrimental to lose that support. And the social interaction of school is a big part of, of child's development, learning to deal with those various life situations that arise and, and the people around you. And it created a lot of anxiety in kids. Uh, worrying about their essential needs and life-threatening viruses should not be part of ch a child's life. Uh, but kids knew what was happening. They, they knew uh, the situation we were in. They could feel the anxiety from parents and staff and and that's sad, but obviously it filtered to kids. For parents, worrying about your child's safety, you know, and their well-being is stressful for any parent. We all still worry about that, even with grown kids. Uh, you know, to, to think that your little children might be at risk is, is certainly tough. Balancing everything with your work responsibilities or being worried about continuation of work and income, very tough for families. And then to take teaching responsibilities on through all of this, you know, I think maybe a lot of families developed a greater appreciation for teachers. I would say that's a plus, but uh, you know, being that teacher for a while, uh, maybe increase that some. And we all love our kids, but 24 seven every day is, is a lot of togetherness. There's no doubt about it. So we're stretching the bounds there. And then, you know, it, it affected parents' uh, lives and, and uh, interactions with other adults and, and just so much change. So a lot of anxiety for parents in this as well. And then staff members, uh, you know, for, people that weren't specifically teachers in schools, you know, that's kind of a tough one. Secretaries, paras, custodians worrying about their livelihood. Teachers trying to figure out how to provide instruction as we discussed earlier. Special education delivery, uh, trying to meet the needs of those special kids. We use Zoom to do a lot of interactions, but doing speech and language or 
or for deaf and hard of hearing kids that we serve to do that remotely, certainly very challenging. And then we had staff who were at high risk due to their health situations or age that, you know, are being asked to return to a classroom when, when their very health and wellness and, and practically, quite frankly, their life is, is almost being put on the line. So certainly tough things there. And, and again, it adds up to anxiety. Seems to be the common theme, doesn't it? That a lot of anxiety in all of this, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the situation we're in. And our final focus area was school leadership. As a superintendent of 21 years, I had to include this one. Uh, just to touch on this, we'll look at how it's affected school boards and, and, uh, and school administrators briefly. For school boards, I, you know, I've worked with school boards for 23 years and, and uh, the vast majority are great people who really care about their kids and communities, maybe a few exceptions, but my observation has been, it's a rather thankless job, to be honest with you. Uh, there is no pay for being a school board member, uh, very little recognition, and people only tend to contact you when there's problems and uh, to complain about uh, something. And complaints often get loud and large, but uh, that's, that's a job they've taken on. So there's a lot of pressure. You've got the safety and well being of the kids. You've got the safety and well-being of your staff, You've got potential litigation issues and all of that. You've got the public weighing in on you. You have a school age, might have a school age child at home that's, that's uh, letting you know their opinion and just a, a lot of pressure in this tough time. And it's a com confrontational atmosphere. Sadly, we live in a time of great polarization. Uh, some folks are adamant about masks, some are some are deadly against masks. It, you know, before, during the summer, it came out uh, in a lot of school districts and, and this discussion as schools looked at whether to require masks or not. And lots of times it was close to 50-50 uh, and it's very heated. People uh, were very strongly opinionated on either side of that issue. And the board is obviously the group that makes the final decision to approve that school's policy. So very, very emotional. Thank goodness there are people willing to take on that role. And finally, school administrators. Now stress is just part of being a, a school administrator, but the, I think the pandemic's taken that to a new level. On days when we used to expect inclement weather and I was a superintendent, I'd get up about 4 a.m. and I'd start driving roads in the county and I'd start listening to the radio and I'd call my neighboring districts and try to figure out, uh, you know, what are we doing? If we close down or if we had school, you know, I would, I would be on pins and needles until I knew every student was safely accounted for in the building and uh, everybody had made it okay. During the pandemic, school leaders are worrying about every student and their staff members potentially catching a deadly virus. And that's, that's a lot of stress. But all of that's based on the guidelines and protocols that you as a school administrator has, have recommended to your board and worked with them to develop. So they've put a lot on. And many decades ago, local control of schools was kind of the expectation. You had a local school board and you worked through things and, and you made it happen locally. But over the years, that has kind of evaporated. Uh, the federal, federal uh, government has gotten involved uh, in a good part of this, especially in special ed. The state does more and more and the legislature seems to set more restrictions annually. But it was kind of interesting that during the pandemic, while decisions could have been made at a lot of different levels throughout the state, most were only too happy to pass that decision on to the local boards to figure out and the local schools. So, uh, you know, that was kind of putting a target on superintendents backs, uh, you know, regarding the complaints, but every district developed their guidelines and plans for how they were going to handle the pandemic and uh, got this figured out. And 
sadly in education, as, as much as people complain about academic issues, uh, you know, it's not real common. For everyone that complains about academics, there's probably 10 times that number that uh, are upset about something regarding athletics. And uh, certainly that reared its uh, head through all this as well. But, uh, you know, we're, we've got through it. We've got a good start. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love athletics and the value of, that uh, it gives kids, but it's not what schools are about. And again, as we discussed with board members, very confrontational atmosphere uh, a lot of times uh, as well. So people with strong opinions that uh, certainly want to share them. So a lot of anxiety there for our school administrators. I can see it weighing on them in our meetings. Uh, they have uh, been in a heightened state of emergency since March. I really do worry about uh, their well-being uh, sometimes. So if you know any school administrators, give them a little encouragement. Uh, you know, they, they have been giving it their very best. And there we have it. As promised, we've gotten through the uh, areas of, of the school. But I have to say, I wouldn't be much of an ESU administrator if I didn't share a little bit about what the ESU has done uh, during all this as well. So. Just very briefly, uh, as I mentioned, we've supported leadership. We have met weekly with our superintendents and our schools. We've met weekly also with the health department, schools and daycares on another Zoom. Uh, that's been going on since March. Uh, working with the state, we secured over 1,200 gallons of hand sanitizer for our 14 school districts. Got that all out to them this summer. and. Uh, actually, that will only get our schools through about the first uh, semester. So about January, they'll be uh, looking for more. We also were able to secure 56,000 face masks for our school districts. That's five for every student and staff in our service region. So ESU 9 serves about 10,000 kids and about 800 teachers. So uh, we were glad to be able to help get that going. Uh, technology wise, we helped to improve internet access throughout our schools and make sure families had, had uh, access. In the finance department, we worked with schools to make sure they were getting all they could uh, in the form of federal funds, the CARES Act money, and that they understood the regulations attached to that. Our special education department really uh, stepped up efforts to go virtual and, and meet the needs of kids through, through remote formats like that. We have licensed mental health therapists. We have uh, 3.2 licensed mental health therapists and they worked with kids in Zoom formats to, to work on mental health issues throughout that process. So really proud of their efforts. And probably one area that uh, really was critical to the success of our schools was our teaching and learning or professional development department. Uh, they hosted weekly cadre meetings for teachers. They would get all the first grade teachers together, for example, and they'd be able to talk about how they were doing things. They worked with teachers on how to use online tools, how to uh, maximize that time that you're online, just help teachers understand the important tricks of teaching in this new world that we were in. So they were really a driving force in keeping things moving. One other thing I wanna mention here, uh, this is a program that we have started this school year. We provide social emotional learning screeners for all of the schools in our service unit. And uh, Hastings Public secured a grant to do this as well and we work with the other 13 schools to provide this service. But mental health screenings, uh, I'm gonna read this uh, part uh, on the bottom right of this screen. Mental health screenings are part of uh, youth mental health. Approximately 50% of lifetime mental health conditions begin by age 14 and 75% begin by age 24. You know, recognizing that there's an issue, a mental health issue early, 
just makes it that much easier to work with and control and, and really is critical. So uh, I think this is a, a great tool for our school districts and it's really helped in several situations. Uh, this just talks about the process that we go through, uh, but in the interest of time, we will move on from that. And uh, you know, who really knows what tomorrow holds? We certainly will have challenges ahead of us, uh, but we've gotten several weeks of school under our belt now, and I think uh, it's gone about as well as we could expect. I believe that we all need to be concerned with how political this issue became as opposed to having a focus on quite simply the, the safety and well-being of our children and our communities. But I know I'm not telling you anything new there. Uh, I know our school personnel and, and leaders have done their best, uh, truly given their best effort. And we may not agree with everything that, that's been done anywhere, but uh, I don't think you could fault anybody's efforts in any of this. So with that, I would certainly be glad to take any questions or I see I'm at 40 minutes. So I'll be glad to sit down and be quiet for a while too, if that's your preference. So thank you all again for the opportunity here. Are there any questions I can answer? This is Belva. My question is, what have you learned about the dead zones, poor zones for internet service and communication that you might have had with the providers in the area, successful or unsuccessful communication? Really, I think most all of the providers in the area stepped up to try to help the schools out. A lot of, a lot of the providers were offering uh, free service for the first several months of this. Uh, most at least were offering it through Christmas even. So they have stepped up. Uh, there are some regions where it's really hard to get access. They did provide hotspots to school districts, um, you know, at a minimal cost or at cost often uh, that kind of help. But, you know, there are just unfortunately some areas of our our service region, if you live down in a little valley and don't have uh, access to a tower or anything, there are spots where it's pretty tough to, to get much. You're right. So I think it's improved greatly. They are still working on ways to improve that. I know the State Department has uh, another initiative called GEARS uh, that they're rolling out here in the next month uh, that is aimed at trying to address that. So. The state used quite a bit of their CARES fund uh, money from the federal government to try to address internet accessibility. This is Phyllis. I have a question about food. Um, where did the funding come that was necessary to increase the, the food for the kids? That was another program uh, through the federal government. Uh, they have provided in the past for uh, areas with high social economic uh, uh, poverty levels, uh, have provided summer food programs where, where they could, students could get food during the summer. They expanded that using uh, federal money to include all students during the pandemic. So schools, uh, there truly is a free lunch right now. So, uh, going out for, for students. So that was Federal CARES Act money. Drew, I wanted to check with you, um, I guess your thoughts or what you're hearing from the ESU um, districts in terms of how schools are handling student illnesses where they're not COVID symptoms, but the, the kind of thing where normally whether it be a, a teacher or a student, it would just kind of be overlooked in the past and they'd fight through it. But, you know, be it a runny nose or, or whatever, how, how are things being handled on that end? Good question, Tony. Uh, you know, that's a tough one. I, I was noticing I was a little more congested just the other day, but, you know, I get a little congested this time of year every year. So now it's trying to figure out, you know, what is, 
a potential COVID situation or symptom as opposed to just normal allergies or cold and flu. We've worked with the health department to the best of our ability. You know, the, the regulations from the CDC and or guidelines from the CDC and the health department throughout this have, have been that you cannot test out of a quarantine. For example, if you're supposed to be quarantined for 14 days, you can't go get a test and it comes back negative and you say, oh, well, I'm okay, I'm in the clear. Because sometimes those tests don't come back positive till day 13 or 14. So you can't test out of quarantine, but you can get an alternative diagnosis to get out of quarantine. So for example, if you have alert, severe allergies, you could go to the doctor and get a note from the doctor that says, Joey has severe allergies, please excuse him. And that would allow you to keep that child in school then as opposed to keeping them out for 14 days. So that alternative diagnosis piece is probably the best thing that schools have working with that. But, you know, everybody's going to have to use some, some good judgment in that. And, and that's a tough thing to ask parents who are trying to head off to work in the morning, maybe to, you know, uh, you know, make sure you check your child and, and, you know, make sure they're some symptomatic free. Uh, they're going to have to, we're going to have to rely on, on parents and, and kids to work with us on that and make sure we're working with normal issues as opposed to COVID symptoms. Phil so, Salyards again. Um, looking to the future, we may have a vaccine one of these days. Um, have you all started exploring whether you're going to require a vaccine? And what standards you'll use to decide when we've got the situation with multiple vaccines, which will probably have varying efficacies, um, how are you going to handle that? That's going to be a really nasty situation. I think you're right, Phyllis. That is going to be uh, quite challenging. I, and I think it's, you know, been relayed to the schools that uh, we're not necessarily going to be able to require every student to have a vaccination. But, uh, you know, first of all, I would say in, in these discussions, it's been made clear that the first wave to get this will be healthcare workers. And that's understandable. I, you know, healthcare workers need those first doses. Uh, potentially teachers might fit into that in, in the second early on in the second or, or potentially third wave. And then, you know, it'll work down towards students as well. I don't know that they'll get, you know, that immediate response uh, once the vaccine is created. Again, I, I don't believe it will be something, you know, from the legal opinions I've heard that we can require students to have, but certainly would be highly suggested and and I have no good answer to the debate about, uh, you know, what's the best vaccine. And I think we'll just have to let time help us with that one. I think as those vaccines roll out, you know, and are used, maybe feedback will come out or research will be showing what the best, best solutions are. I do worry because, you know, this affects everybody so differently. I, some people have this and, and the greatest number are asymptomatic. And yet for 200,000 of our population, it's been deadly. You know, it's, it's not the same for everybody. So, you know, I, I wonder too, will the vaccines affect people differently? You know, as, as, just as the virus affects everybody differently, will those vaccines have a different effectiveness on different people? This is Judy Sandine. Um, my question is, and it may vary from school to school, um, when a ch if a child turns up positive and they're in school, uh, what does the school do? Well, um, we have worked closely with the health department to try to have communications between the schools and, and the health department so that we know who's on quarantine. Uh, the health department contacts those families. Um, 
you know, ultimately, you know, the schools have a choice. They can, uh, some school districts send those students home. Some isolate those students and, and contact the families. Uh, legally, uh, there's a question about whether you can send them home. Uh, quite frankly, also under the current directive health measures, they're creating a misdemeanor offense by being out when they're supposed to be under quarantine. So there's a lot of different factors. So far, I think I've not heard of any specific situations like this where people just blatantly violated violated the quarantine and sent their kids to school. So I've not heard of that situation specifically occurring, but as this situation gets more and more heated and more kids are getting this, I would not be surprised if we'd run into that situation at some point. My question wasn't clear. You answered a good question. Oh, <laughs> um, all right. was, no, you did. What I was really wondering about is, you know, a child is, has been in a classroom for quite some time and then they get sick and they get tested and it's, we learn that they're positive. What happens with all those other students who oh, have been okay. exposed? Sorry about that. Yes. No, no, I, I didn't ask it clearly. Not your fault. I don't know if I could find the page that has that guidance on it, but um, to show you, but I've got it handy here. Um, recently, uh, when the new directive health measures came out, the uh, governor uh, worked with the health departments to kind of create some new guidance on that. So in a situation where all students are masked, if everybody in the classroom is wearing a mask, only the child who tests positive is going to need to be isolated. All the others will be allowed to self-monitor at school. So, and that just changed at the beginning of, of the week because okay. before the health departments were probably quarantining those students that were in the classroom that were not wearing masks but maybe allowing those to stay if they had been masked. Okay. Uh, for students that are not masked at school, uh, anybody that is a close contact to them, so within six foot for, for 15 minutes or more is how they define a close contact, uh, those students are going to be quarantined. And if there's a situation where a student is masked and some students in the classroom are masked and some are not. Any students that are unmasked are probably going to be put in quarantine. Any okay. close contacts. Thank you. You bet. Now, I would, I'd add in this part, they, they kind of changed the guidelines as far as they affect athletics and activities in that at that same time. Because at first we were having a lot of issues with, with football and uh, you know, kind of hard to wear a mask in football, but I know some have been trying to do it. I know volleyball teams have probably been better about masking, but the guidance on that that came out was that um, if exposure occurs during extracurricular activities that play, take place outdoors or in large spaces such as gyms, uh, in lieu of quarantine, students can self-monitor. So, they're, you know, they're allowing those kids to self-monitor. I think it was last Friday that Hastings got on the road to Alliance. Uh, Hastings football team got on the road to Alliance, got about halfway there and got a phone call that Alliance had a positive test case and, and they had to turn around and come back. But now under the new guidelines, they would not necessarily, where they're all outside, they would not necessarily quarantine everybody but they would just ask those kids to self-monitor. Any other questions today? Well, hopefully I haven't bored you too much uh, throughout this process. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you today and, and uh, thank you for, for allowing that. All right, well, thank you, Drew, for being with us today. And uh, all the information was great. Thank you so much.